So much has been said and written about the Great Sphinx of Giza that one could spend years simply accumulating and reading the research of others. This iconic monument has shepherded human civilization down through the ages, from the earliest known times of Old Kingdom Egypt, through thousands of years of wars and conquering armies, multiple periods of restoration and occupation. And yet, despite all of this, it is still standing today as one of the greatest, most enigmatic and most famous works that humankind has ever crafted. In recent decades, the long-established provenance of this monument has been challenged, with strong scientific evidence pointing towards a much longer time frame, and the possibility of a sophisticated civilization existing on Earth for many millennia, and long before our currently accepted dates for the emergence of human civilization. The Sphinx was originally thought to have been created during the infamous Fourth Dynasty of Ancient Egypt. That same incredible and yet fairly short period of time that we today credit with the greatest achievements of Egypt. Mighty works like the Mega Pyramids at Giza, Dashur and Maidum, as well as many other massive megalithic works like the Valley Temple. I have a video on my channel that breaks down the specific timeline of the 4th dynasty and of these achievements, if you're interested in those details. But let's just say that according to orthodox history, an awful lot was achieved in an awfully short amount of time. Even though Egypt's 4th dynasty is located far back in antiquity, roughly some 4,600 years ago, geological and scientific evidence now points to a potentially far longer history than this for the iconic Sphinx. This evidence grants us fresh context and perspective, from which we can view various attributes and aspects of the Sphinx as well as historical accounts of it in a new light. In this video, we're going to take a closer look at the accounts of its very first excavation in what we might call modern times, or at least in the last few hundred years. This information isn't as readily available as you might think it is. And in fact, the account of this work was only uncovered in 2002 in previously unpublished volumes that were discovered in the archives of the British Museum when they were preparing to move to a new location. These volumes were handwritten and drawn by Henry Salt, who was the British Consul General in Egypt from 1816 until 1827. They tell the tale of the excavation work done by his friend, Giovanni Cavigula, a Genese merchant ship captain, somebody who became enthralled with the mystery of Egypt and ultimately spent decades working there trying to uncover her secrets. Giovanni Cavigula isn't a particularly well-known figure today, and neither is the work that he did at Giza, perhaps because Henry Salt's account of it was never fully published. Despite this, Cavigula was responsible for some significant and quite famous discoveries. He was the first man in modern times to discover the connection between the well shaft and the descending passageway in the Great Pyramid, also the first man in modern times to clear out and even enter the subterranean chamber of that same structure. He was also the first person in thousands of years to excavate the Sphinx. As far as we know, the last full excavation prior to Cavigula's work in 1817 was that done by Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius in around 160 AD, nearly two millennia prior to this. At some point after the Romans excavated it, the desert once again claimed the Sphinx, and for centuries it has been buried up to its neck in sand. These two accounts aren't the only ones in history of the Sphinx having to be dug out of the sands of time. The same thing occurred in the dynastic Egyptian civilization in the 18th dynasty in around 1550 BC as recorded by the pharaoh Thutmose IV. The fact that the Sphinx has been buried in sand for the vast majority of the time during which human civilization has developed is not something that's widely known, but it's very relevant when it comes to evaluating the signs of age and the erosion that we find on its body and on the walls of the bedrock enclosure from which it was carved. In the decades just before Giovanni Cavigula's dig at Egypt, Napoleon Bonaparte ran a military campaign through that area, and this was somewhat unusual in that included in his party was a large number of scholars or academics, at the time known as savants, nearly 170 of them. These savants documented and explored many of the ancient monuments and sites of Egypt. 
And in fact, the expedition that was conducted during Napoleon's time was responsible for discovering the famous Rosetta Stone, and it's generally credited with the origins of the modern field of Egyptology itself. While at Giza, his forces also did some digging and some work in the area and at the Sphinx, although he only uncovered the back or the spine of this monument. If you haven't seen Napoleon's works before, his book, Description de la Egypte, which was put together by the savants that were in his employ, is just a beautiful early technical accounting of many of the monuments and sites of Egypt. And it's one of the earliest products of the Enlightenment and the emergence of the scientific method. I'd recommend taking a look at this if you haven't seen it. You can find this book and digitally borrow it at the Internet Archive, which is the online repository of so many of these old books. Well, at least you can borrow this book at the moment, because sadly, if the despicable and greedy publishing companies that are currently suing the Internet Archive get their way, then this invaluable resource is going to go the way of the dodo and disappear from the Internet altogether, and all in the name of more corporate profits. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that what these companies are doing is the equivalent of trying to burn down the modern-day digital equivalent to the Library of Alexandria. All because of their greed and the fact that they can't handle the idea of the unwashed masses like you and I digitally borrowing and potentially learning something from some just incredible old books and resources without them getting their slice of cash for it. In any case, Henry Salt's account from the British Museum is one of those rare things that you can't actually find online or at the Internet Archive. Researchers found these two volumes of Salt's work in 2002, each of them now more than 200 years old. One of them contained Salt's handwritten account of all of the work, with many annotations and edits from several other people, and the other volume was his diagrams and his sketches. It took significant time and effort to research their provenance and then put the history of these accounts together. Eventually, these books were published in 2007 in a very limited quantity, as the British Museum Research Publication number 164, which is called The Sphinx Revealed, a forgotten record of pioneering excavations. If you search for it, you can find these occasionally on the second-hand book market, but at this point they are getting pretty pricey. Fortunately, I did manage to find one and get my hands on it in 2019. Quoting from the researcher's introduction of this same publication. Quote, In the spring of 2002, when the library and archives of the Department of Ancient Egypt and Sudan at the British Museum were being relocated, after the department had moved its offices, Two volumes of manuscript material attracted our attention. The volumes had been catalogued but never studied in depth, and many of the illustrations appeared to be otherwise unknown. Both volumes had been bound in maroon buckram with an imitation sharkskin finish, and brown calf spines and corners for what was then known as the Department of Antiquities. The smaller volume was inscribed in gilt on the spine, Department of Antiquities, Salt, Memoir on Pyramids and Sphinx, text. The larger one was entitled Department of Antiquities, Salt, Memoir on Pyramids and Sphinx, Atlas. Henry Salt, British Consul General in Egypt from 1816 until his death in 1827, had carefully prepared this work for publication and sent it to London, where it had been edited by his colleagues. It was the dramatic account of the discoveries made in 1817 by the Genese mercantile captain Giovanni Cavigula at the Great Pyramid of Giza, including a survey and excavations at the surrounding necropolis and the first clearance of the Sphinx since ancient times. End quote. Cavigula's dig was the first one in thousands of years to uncover the full scale of the Sphinx, its chest and its paws, the famous granite stella and altar that still sits between them, as well as the fragments of its beard and numerous other Roman works, including a large staircase and platform that has since been destroyed. Although there's no doubt that people had been digging around the area of the Sphinx, it took a monumental effort and huge numbers of people to try and clear that much sand from the desert. From this account, it was one of those two steps forward, one step back type of affairs, with sand constantly spilling back into digs and refilling previously dug work overnight. 
Although Cavigula spent a lot of time and effort clearing out many of the tombs around Giza, as well as clearing out areas of the Great Pyramid, these efforts really paled in comparison to the work he had to put in on the Sphinx. Henry Salt describes this in his account, talking about Captain Cavigula's efforts in 1817. Quote, the exertions made by Captain Cavigula in clearing out the chambers and passages, which I have already had occasion to describe, may be considered as sufficiently arduous, but the whole of these united exertions cannot in any degree be compared with the extreme laboriousness of his operations at the Sphinx. In these, he displayed an indefatigable perseverance, which astonished every person who witnessed it, and which led at length to the discovery of the valuable remains of antiquity hereafter to be described. End quote. Interestingly, one of the reasons for the dig were the reports from Napoleon's expedition of a doorway that led into chambers that were inside the Sphinx. Initially, Cavigula dug a narrow trench on the northern side of the monument, although this really only served to illustrate the full magnitude of the task that was before him. Quote, From various reports in circulation in Egypt, I was given to understand that the French engineers, during their stay here, had made a considerable excavation in front of the Sphinx, and that they had just discovered a door, at the time when they were compelled to suspend their operation. This account was confirmed by the repeated assertions of the Arabs, several of whom declared that they had been present at the discovery and said that the door led into the body of the Sphinx, while others confirmed that it conducted up to the second pyramid. Though little stress could be laid upon such asseverations, yet they rendered Captain Cavigula very unwilling to give up his researches, without doing all in his power at least to ascertain the facts. To this end, he first began to open a deep trench on its left or northern side, opposite the shoulders of the statue, and though the sand was so loose that the wind drove back at night more than half of what he could excavate in the day, yet he managed, by the aid of planks, arranged so as to support its falling side, to dig down a few days to its base. As the trench, however, was not more than 20 feet across at the top and not above 3 feet wide at the bottom, the situation of the workmen below became evidently dangerous, since if any large body of sand had fallen in, it must have irrevocably smothered those who were working near the base. In consequence, it became necessary to abandon the first excavation, the only result of which was the measurement of the statue from the top of the head to the base. The external surface of the body in this part was found to be composed of irregularly sized stones, built up with much care, and covered with red paint, with no very clear indications of the form, but having three protruding ledges, one below the other, sufficiently broad for a man to walk upon, and which formed in all probability the lines of the mantle or dress. This I have expressed in the accompanying design, which is drawn accordingly to my ideas of what the statue must have appeared after being restored, as I conceive it to have been, by the Romans. This result, although not very satisfactory, stimulated Captain Cavigula to undertake another excavation on a larger scale, in front, which was commenced in the beginning of March, and continued without intermission until the end of June, during which time from 60 to 100 persons were constantly employed. End quote. Cavigula then worked to clear out a great trench in front of the Sphinx, and for the first time in millennia its chest and paws were revealed to the sky, and he made several discoveries that are now quite well-known and famous artefacts. He found parts of the uraeus, which is the snake that sits at the front of pharaonic crowns, as well as several segments from the beard of the sphinx. Some of these can still be seen today in the Cairo Museum. These finds prompted Henry Salt to make a sketch of what he believed the sphinx may have looked like after the restoration work that was likely undertaken by the Romans. These artefacts were discovered in a small chamber that was found to be underneath its chin, roughly 10 feet by 5 feet in size. This chamber no longer exists, but its walls were made up of carved and inscribed limestone. As Cavigula slowly cleared this area, he found that the back wall of this small chamber was slightly different, and it was in fact an incredible granite stella that was beautifully inscribed. Quote, Four or five other fragments of the plaited part of the beard were afterwards found buried in the sands, and from the whole of these pieces together I was induced to restore it, as appears in sketch 29. 
About the same time, a fragment inscribed with hieroglyphics engraved in a double row was dug out, which, from its dimensions and ornaments, I conceive to have formed a part of the wall or pillar, which must necessarily have been left for the support of the beard, part of which, built of stone, remained in its position at the bottom, and this I have in like manner introduced into the design. Most of the fragments aforementioned were found lying in a small and tolerably regular chamber, about 10 feet long by 5 broad, and situated immediately under the chin, and which, if the account of Pliny may be believed, is not unlikely to have contained the body of Amasis, one of the kings of Egypt. Soon after this discovery, a large block of granite became visible, which proved to be highly embellished on the face fronting the east, with sculpture in bas-relief representing two sphinxes seated on pedestals, with priests holding out offerings, and a long inscription beneath in hieroglyphics beautifully executed. The whole design being canopied with the sacred globe, serpent, and wings. This tablet constitutes part of a small open temple, the two sides of which were composed of other tablets of calcareous stone, somewhat similarly adorned, one of which only remained in its place, the other having fallen on its front, has since been removed and forwarded to the British Museum. At this time, the excavation had advanced more than a hundred feet from the Sphinx, measuring it on the surface, owing to the necessity of allowing a sufficient space for the shelving of the sand. It is difficult for any person unused to operations of this kind to form any idea of the difficulties Captain Cavigula had to surmount when working at the depth of the base, as, in spite of all precautions, the slightest breath of wind or concussion of any kind set all the surrounding particles of sand in motion, so that the impending sides began to crumble in, and mass after mass came tumbling down, till the whole surface took no unapt resemblance to a cascade. Even when the sides appeared most firm, if the labourers suspended their work for but an hour, they found on their return that they had the greater part of their labour to do again. This was particularly the case on the southern side of the right paw, where the whole of the people were employed for seven days without making any sensible advance, the sand rolling down in one continual and regular torrent. End quote. This granite stele that Cavigula found is, of course, known today as the famous Dream Stella that was erected by Thutmose IV during the 18th dynasty around 1450 BC. It is, or rather was, a 15-ton slab of inscribed granite that was, like so many other objects in ancient Egypt, originally part of an old kingdom structure. Thutmose IV repurposed it, he moved it and then had it carved with the inscriptions that it is today so famous for. Not all of this slab remains in place today, but it's a remarkable bit of work, and an example of the all-too-common renovation and reuse of Old Kingdom granite structures by later rulers. This is something that I've talked about many times across my videos. I think this is another good example of the great contradiction of the story of Egyptian civilization, that somehow in its very earliest periods, with nothing more than copper and flint tools, the Egyptians had the highest levels of capability, quarrying and working in massive granite stones, building huge and eternal structures like the most famous of the pyramids. Then, later on, presumably with thousands of years of progress and the growth of civilization, along with the use of more advanced metals, the civilization of the Middle and New Kingdoms could never match the works of the Old Kingdom in scale or grandeur, and they were quick to repurpose and claim the mighty stonework of their ancestors for themselves. It seems to me that a much more likely scenario might be that the Old Kingdom was kicked off with some significant assistance, from perhaps their own legacy of forefathers, perhaps from a lost and vastly more ancient civilization of high technology and capability, and they inherited much of their knowledge and some of their monuments from them. After all, this is precisely what the Egyptians themselves say. They don't claim to have been a new civilization, but rather a legacy of what came before. In Cavigula and Salt's time in the early 1800s, the story written on the Dream Stele was indecipherable. The science of translating hieroglyphs was really only in its infancy at this time. When eventually translated, the Stella spoke of a dream that the young Prince Thutmose had when he fell asleep in the shadow of the Sphinx. 
The monument spoke to him in this dream, and it said that if he cleared the sand from the monument and restored it, that he would become king of all Egypt. He evidently followed up on these instructions, and he recorded this tale on the dream stele when he was the king, although half of the inscription, along with the rest of the stone that it was written on, is now missing. It's interesting to think that at this point in time, some 3,500 years ago in the past, the Sphinx was already vastly ancient and already buried up to its neck in sand. Keep this fact in mind as we'll come back to it a little later on. In this area between the paws of the Sphinx were also discovered several sculptures of lions, along with a granite altar, the remains of which is still standing in place today, although not in the full form as captured by one of Henry Salt's sketches. Another interesting element in this area is something that many people may miss when they visit it, and that is that the area beneath the paws is not in fact bedrock, rather it's a constructed stone platform or a pavement. As far as I know, we have no indication, at least in the public sphere, whether or not there is anything beneath this pavement or if it's been laid directly onto the bedrock. I suspect that this is the most likely scenario that it's been laid onto the bedrock. I'd think that if there are any chambers beneath the Sphinx, they would be much deeper than just beneath this artificial floor. The pavement was most likely part of the Roman restoration work that was done here, but that's not to say that there's no mystery involved with what might be below the Sphinx. Rather, it's something of the opposite case. There's really no end to the mystery of this topic. Throughout history, there has always been reports and conjecture about possible chambers or tunnels in the Sphinx or below it. The often discussed Hall of Records is a good example. Certainly the idea of bedrock chambers that are underneath the ground isn't exactly out of the ordinary when it comes to ancient Egyptian and in particular Old Kingdom sites. The Osiris shaft, which is just up the causeway here at Giza, descends some 100 feet into the bedrock with multiple levels and chambers. There are also test shafts and many other underground areas at Giza, including those beneath the Great Pyramid itself. There are literally miles and miles and multiple levels of bedrock tunnels and chambers at nearby Saqqara, also an Old Kingdom site. These all stretch out from beneath the Steppe Pyramid and all around it. And that's not to mention the nearby mighty Serapium, which includes just some massive tunnels and chambers, again, all cut from the bedrock. There are also reports of granite blocks being found deep beneath the ground in front of the Valley Temple at Giza, these were found when a test hole was drilled, and this is very close to the location of the Sphinx. A Japanese seismic survey that was done in the late 1980s that used electromagnetic waves to probe underground indicated the presence of multiple cavities and tunnels beneath the Sphinx. There have also been other seismic studies conducted in the 90s, like the covert shore expedition of 1996 that also indicated the presence of geological cavities. Not only that, but there are at least three known entrances that go into the Sphinx itself, and there are also several first-hand accounts coming from various people throughout the last couple of centuries that talk of entering the Sphinx and finding chambers and the remains of boxes. In today's times, most of these entrances have been concreted in or bricked over as part of the modern repairs to the Sphinx, but there is one entrance that is still near the left hip at the rear of the Sphinx that's still open and still the subject for a lot of intrigue. Egyptologists Mark Lehner and Zahi Hawass supervised a series of drilling tests around the Sphinx in 2008 and 2009, and this happened after decades of refusing exactly these same types of tests. Perhaps unsurprisingly, they declared that nothing whatsoever was found. While I really have no reason not to believe that they didn't find anything with their drilling, this isn't exactly a scientific or comprehensive conclusion. All we have to go on from this is their declaration that nothing was found. I don't believe that any results from these drill tests have ever been made publicly available, nor any solid information on the exact methods and results from these drill tests. To me, this is the real issue here. There just doesn't seem to be enough data or concrete information about this topic available. There is plenty of evidence from multiple surveys in the past that do indicate both the presence and location of chambers underneath the ground. So whether they are there or they're not, it does seem like we could definitively answer this question with modern technology one way or the other. 
In 1996, as part of the shore expedition, Hawass himself said to the press that there were in fact tunnels under the Sphinx, as well as all around the pyramids, and that they would prove to, quote, carry many secrets of the buildings of the pyramids, end quote. Certainly, any exploration of this area today would be challenged by the modern-day rise in the level of the water table, and this was ostensibly the reason for these drilling projects in the first place. Although there is also significant evidence that drilling has been going on underneath the Sphinx since as early as 1978, with some familiar faces involved. It seems to me that more investigation is warranted here, and I do suspect that it's quite likely that more discoveries are just waiting to be made. There are all sorts of modern, non-invasive, non-destructive ground-penetrating techniques that I think could and should be applied here. Given the long history of rumours about chambers beneath the Sphinx, as well as the uh, odd relationship that some of our favourite establishment figures seem to have with Edgar Cayce and his foundation, the Association for Research and Enlightenment, the whole mess seems shrouded in intrigue and mystery. Personally, I just find this to be frustrating, and while sometimes it's fun to speculate about covert digs, ancient prophecies, secret societies and conspiracies, I think basic questions like what's under the Sphinx could be answered with modern technology if only we had the permission to do so. It does make you wonder a little bit why this hasn't happened though, doesn't it? In any case, coming back to Henry Salt's account of the stone pavement at the front of the Sphinx, most of this today is covered up by the wooden boardwalk that's been built over it, but you can still see some part of it in my images here, and it's also something that Brian Forrester remarked on in his latest video that explored this area. It's no coincidence that this boardwalk here has been put in place. It's not simply there in order for people to walk on it so they don't get their shoes dirty, but we've been told by an inside source that the opening or entrance to the tunnel system under the Sphinx is under this boardwalk. You can also see this constructed stone floor in Henry Salt's sketches. This stonework caused Cavigula and Salt to initially theorise that the entire Sphinx might have been built on a pedestal. And it was only later, as their excavation progressed, that they realised that the Sphinx had been carved out of a hollow or an enclosure in the bedrock. Today, we understand that many massive limestone blocks were removed from the bedrock in order to make this enclosure, some weighing up to and over 200 tonnes, and these were then used in the construction of the Valley Temple. Quote, a considerable portion of the left leg being now laid open, and the stone platform still continuing, it became a new incentive to proceed, and in about a fortnight more, Captain Cavigula succeeded in completely cleaning the pore, when he discovered the outer walls of the temple, together with a granite altar standing in front. It was also ascertained that at about two feet south of the last digit, the stone platform abruptly terminated. This latter circumstance led to the conjecture that the whole body of the Sphinx might be placed upon a pedestal. In this, however, we were altogether mistaken, for on carrying on the operations towards the northern side in front, it was discovered that the platform there continued on an uninterrupted level, and soon after, to our great surprise, an ascending flight of steps became visible, which, in contradiction to our supposition, proved the Sphinx to be placed in a hollow. End quote. Here, Henry Salt is describing the discovery of a vast Roman construction that was in front of the Sphinx. A wide staircase and esplanade leading up to and away from the Sphinx that was originally connected to this pavement that is now underneath the pause. These are his sketches of this work, from the pause of the Sphinx leading away, and then from the perspective of looking at them with the Sphinx at your back. It extended up and away from the Sphinx to the point where the ground itself falls away from the plateau and included viewing platforms for VIPs, kind of like a corporate box for the Emperor, presumably in order to view ceremonies that were held between the paws of the Sphinx. It must have been quite a sight. All of this Roman work has since been demolished, and no trace of it remains at Giza, perhaps only the pavement between the paws that we discussed earlier. 
This is yet another reminder that what we see today is but a fraction of the multiple incarnations and periods of both construction, renovation, and destruction the monuments of Egypt have endured over the ages, and perhaps none so as much as the Sphinx. The beautiful ancient monument that we can visit today, and pay a special permission price in order to enter the enclosure and stand between its repaired and rebuilt paws, this isn't your great granddaddy Sphinx, and it certainly doesn't come close to resembling the Sphinx as it was uncovered by Cavigula in 1817. The pores and much of the lower areas of the body of the Sphinx have been repaired over the last couple of centuries. The neck of this sphinx was previously much thicker than it appears today, as part of the headdress has also been reconstructed in our modern times. We know that the Romans made repairs to the sphinx, as did the dynastic Egyptians on several occasions. Curiously, although it's claimed that the Sphinx was created in the 4th Dynasty of the Old Kingdom, it's also on record that there are 4th Dynasty repairs to the Sphinx. How exactly does this work? The 4th Dynasty was not a particularly long time, and if you made your monument in this period, why are there records of it also being repaired in the same time frame? No discussion on the age of the Sphinx would be complete without mentioning the work in the late 1990s of the legendary John Anthony West and the Professor of Geology Dr Robert Schock. Together they redated the Sphinx by analysing the erosion patterns found on the limestone walls of the bedrock enclosure from which it was carved, and the details of this story are likely well known to anyone with even a passing interest in the Sphinx itself. As a brief summary, however, working on the invitation and the intuition of John Anthony West, Dr. Schock identified the vertical erosion features of the limestone walls of the Sphinx enclosure as rainfall erosion, and something that would have required significant and extended periods of heavy rainfall to form. Schock, as well as several other qualified geologists, categorically state that this is not wind or sand erosion, as was previously assumed to be the case by Egyptologists. If you show images of this erosion to any geologist, without mentioning the context of where it is and thus avoiding the contention around what it could mean, you'll likely get the same answer. It's textbook rainfall erosion as it appears on limestone. Given that this area of Egypt has not been subject to this type of weather and rainfall since the period around 9,000 to 11,000 years ago, this conclusion that the Sphinx and its enclosure may be significantly older than the dynastic Egyptian civilization caused quite a stir, and understandably so. Even today, over 20 years later, it's still a hotly contested subject. You don't have to go very far to find evidence for this contention either, and once again we visit that bastion of establishment groupthink Wikipedia, where this rainfall erosion theory is, perhaps predictably, firmly labelled as a fringe claim. In my opinion, this is both unsurprising and also a ridiculous statement. The rainfall erosion theory is one that is firmly supported by science, and the rebuttals against it that are listed on this page are, at least in my opinion, weak at best. Without getting into the details, because we could probably sit here for another 30 minutes just talking about this one facet of the Sphinx, it probably is worth noting that the original argument that was made against these claims by Western Shock, and this argument is one that is still listed on this Wikipedia page, it's an argument that came from Zahi Huas himself, and this was that the Sphinx could not come from this earlier period, this 5,000 years or more before the ancient Egyptian civilization, as there is no evidence of of any other megalithic civilization or works that predate the ancient Egyptians to this degree. And to be fair, this argument was made only a couple of years after the dig in Turkey at the now famous Gobekli Tepe site had begun, and back then in the late 90s, his observation was most likely correct. We hadn't really understood what we'd found at Gobekli Tepe. Since then, however, Gobekli Tepe has turned out to be a huge megalithic site, one that's located not very far from Egypt, and it's one that dates to at least the period that is mentioned by Shock, some nine to 11,000 years ago, which is 5,000 years or more before the dynastic Egyptians ever kicked off, and thus it directly contradicts this argument. 
That said, do you think Gobekli Tepe is mentioned anywhere on the Wikipedia page about this so-called fringe theory? Survey says... This is an interesting topic, and I was there in Egypt in 2015 when Zahi Hawass was asked directly about the relevance of Gobekli Tepe as they apply to the origins of ancient Egypt. This was captured on video by several other members on that tour. I'd recommend checking out the full video if you haven't seen it. I've left a link to it down in the description below. It was quite a dramatic day, really. This was supposed to be the first debate between Zahi Hawass and Graham Hancock. Didn't really pan out that way. Uh, it's a story that I think I'd, I'd like to tell on a live stream um, about this trip and particularly about this day at some point in the future. Essentially, Zahi Hawass just claimed that he didn't have any knowledge of Gobekli Tepe. Uh, he also made the proclamation that he doesn't believe in radar and has never found anything using it. And then Graham Hancock responded with what I think is a concise summary of the argument and exactly why Gobekli Tepe does, in fact, have an impact on the age of the Sphinx. The argument uh, about the Sphinx made by Dr. Mark Lager some years ago uh, was that the Sphinx couldn't possibly be 12,000 years old because there was no other site, no other megalithic site anywhere in the world which was anywhere in the range of 12,000 years old. Uh, when we have a major discovery conducted by a respected archaeological institute in Turkey of a major megalithic site which is 11,600 years old, I believe it vitiates that argument against an absence of context for the sticks, which is also uh, a megalithic monument. It's worth noting that this figure of nine to 11,000 years old, which was made by John Anthony West and Robert Schock, is perhaps the youngest estimate. It's a very conservative figure intended, I think, to engage the establishment in some form of discussion rather than just having them dismiss it out of hand. It's certainly possible that the erosion patterns on the walls of the Sphinx enclosure could indicate a much longer timeline, even up to some 30,000 years or more. Another piece of evidence suggesting that the Sphinx is far older than the orthodox timeline suggests is the Orion correlation, a theory presented by Robert Boval, which aligns the entire Giza Plateau and the Nile with the Orion constellation and the Milky Way in the heavens above. Using precession of the equinoxes and the presumption that the Sphinx was originally a lion, the constellation of Leo would have risen due east of the Sphinx during the vernal equinox, approximately 10,500 years ago. Unsurprisingly, Wikipedia also labels this as a fringe theory. Whether the Sphinx was originally a lion, or whether it was Anubis, which is a case that my friend Chuck at the CF Apps 7865 channel argues quite convincingly, I think the only thing that we can be truly certain of is that the head of the Sphinx was most definitely recarved, as it just doesn't seem to have the same degree of age that the other parts of the monument do. It's also blindingly obvious that this head has been recarved to anyone with the most basic sense of proportion. This isn't something that the ancient Egyptians often got wrong, but when you look at the Sphinx, it's obvious that the head is far too small for the body. And I think this is particularly evident if you can find older photographs that show the original dimensions of the neck. I think it was most likely recarved in dynastic times, probably early in the Old Kingdom, and well before Thutmose IV erected his dream stele, as depictions of the Sphinx that are shown on the stele also have it with this current human head. The sculpture itself could well be of somebody from the 4th dynasty, perhaps even Khufu or Cheops, as suggested by Matt at the Ancient Architects channel in his latest video. It's worth noting here again that there are repairs to the Sphinx that date from this early period. And for once, this isn't something that's labelled just as a fringe theory. In fact, it's not even contested. It's stated by establishment Egyptologists like Lena and Hawass that these repairs happened in the 4th dynasty. The fact is that this simply doesn't reconcile with the idea that it was also built in the same period. This is yet another one of those contradictions to the story of history that is just hiding in plain sight. The other thing to consider about the Sphinx is that it has been buried up to its neck in sand for millennia. It was buried in King Thutmose's time. After all, he tells the story of how he had to dig it up. And it was buried before the Greek-Roman period because they had to dig it up. 
Presumably at some point after that, it again was buried in sand because Cavigula had to dig it up for the first time in the modern era in 1817. Even after Cavigula's dig, it didn't take long once again for the Sphinx to become buried in sand up to its neck, as the science of photography developed after his time, and we have many antique photos that show the Sphinx's head poking up out of the desert. Notice that we do not see the same type of heavy erosion on the head of the Sphinx, the same type of erosion that we see on parts of its body or on the walls of the enclosure. Isn't this strange, considering the head was the only part of the Sphinx to have not been buried in sand for all this time? This is an important point, because the idea that these erosion marks on the enclosure and on the body of the Sphinx were created by wind-borne sand is still used, to this day, to refute the evidence presented by John Anthony West and Robert Schock. It's an absolutely massive contradiction. You have the head of the Sphinx poking up out of the desert, never been buried in sand, doesn't show any signs of this form of wind-borne sand erosion, yet at the same time, you've got these elements of the Sphinx that have been buried in the sand, and we're claiming that the erosion on these was created by wind-borne sand. In what world does this explanation for what we can see with our own eyes make any sense? I think the truth is that you need thousands of years of rainfall to create the erosion patterns that we see on the limestone. And this means thousands of years for the full enclosure being exposed to the elements, as well as a climate that produces this type of rain. I believe this occurred before this area was overtaken by the Sahara Desert. We have to go back to the heavy rainout period that occurred after the Younger Dryas event of some 13,000 years ago, or perhaps even before then, a time when this area of Egypt was not a desert, but rather a verdant paradise. I think this monument, that today we call the Great Sphinx, is an enduring echo and a record of human achievement, and something that comes to us from a lost ancient civilization that existed on this planet long before we ever thought possible. Thanks for watching. Hey all, I hope you found that somewhat interesting. Uh, I've been wanting to sort of get my teeth into the Sphinx and sort of lay down what I think about it uh, for some time now. So. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed that video. I do have a number of things to kind of go over in this little segment here, so kind of stand by for a, a longer than usual postscript to this. Uh, the first thing is, is that hopefully by the time this video goes live, you'll be able to see the join button uh, on my channel. For anybody that's looking to, to help me out and support the channel directly here on YouTube, uh, the way I'm going to deal with this is pretty simple. It's the same way I deal with the people on Patreon and Subscribestar. Uh, if anyone who joins the community here will get access to a number of sort of patron only or supporter only videos, some content. But one of the things I wanted to mention specifically relating to the Sphinx is that uh, I will be sharing and you'll see in there as a, the first post kind of all of the details from this book here, which is the Sphinx Revealed. This is Henry Salt's account and this is the publication that came from the, the British um, uh, Museum. So as I was making this video, I was also scanning all of the pages out of this book. That's something that will be available for patrons and supporters that you can get at. Uh, this book does have an amazing amount of resources and information, plenty more in here than I could ever get to in one video. It also includes the full transcription of Henry Salt's account of Cavigula's work at Giza. There's a lot of information in there about early explorations of the Great Pyramid, things like that. Uh, and that's something that I hope to continue going forward with some of the other resources that I have, like Poznanski's book on Tiwanaku, that type of thing. Secondly, I also wanted to let everyone know that my podcast is now available. Uh, I, I hear from a lot of people that they like to, I guess, just listen to the audio from my videos as they're doing work or driving or that type of thing. And I've been asked a number of times if I have that available in an MP3 or a podcast format. Uh, so I'm happy to say that yes, that podcast is now up and available. Search for Uncharted X on Apple iTunes, Spotify Podcasts, Google Podcasts. You should be able to find them. I am working on adding more of these as we go forward. So if you're interested in listening to all of that in, a, in an audio format, then it's all up there in the, you know, your usual podcast libraries. 
Thirdly, I just wanted to provide a quick update as to the Egypt trip. Uh, I, it was first announced, I think, back in February of 2020, and it, it kind of sold out really quickly. And then, you know, 2020 came crashing down around everybody's ears. And I'm very pleased to say that this trip is going ahead. It is filling up. There are a few spaces available, however. So if you're interested in getting to Egypt at, you know, it's, it's short notice at this point, but Egypt's going to be an incredible opportunity given that I think it's going to be mostly free of, of tourists altogether and we stand a good chance of having a lot of these sites to ourselves. The dates for the trip are November 28th to December 12th. I'm also really happy to say that I'm going on this trip with Jimmy from the Bright Insight channel. We've been talking quite a lot and he got on board. All the details are on the website, it's unchartedx.com slash tour. And there'll also be another special guest coming on this trip. Uh, George Howard has registered and he's coming along. Uh, if you don't know who George is, I've done an interview with him on my channel and I'm really looking forward to uh, spending time with Jimmy and George and everybody else in Egypt that makes it. Just a couple of other recommendations that I wanted to get in here. Uh, and these are things that I'm going to talk about in another video that I release here, hopefully pretty soon. But one of those is, is that many of you will know the documentary Revelations of the Pyramids. It's one of my favorite, all time favorite Egyptology and just general, I guess, ancient history and, and, and mystery videos. It's an, it's an excellent piece of work. It was done by Patrice Pouillard. He's a, a French director. Uh, I've been in touch with Patrice recently over the, the last couple of months, I suppose. And he has, he has made a follow-up documentary to Revelations. It's called Builders of the Ancient Mysteries. Uh, and I've seen it. It's just an excellent documentary. I, I do want to give my full review of this, talk a, a little bit about some of the things that were, I guess, achieved in this. I'd highly recommend it. If you look down in the description below, you'll find a link to view the documentary. It's a, a streaming service uh, to view it. I've got an affiliate link there. Uh, if you view it and you want to check it out, it does help me out a little bit. Uh, but as I said, I'm going to talk a bit more about what I think about this documentary in an upcoming video. Something else along the same lines is Josh Blaylock's Ark World. This is just a, an exceptional graphic novel that, that Josh Blaylock has recently been working on, and he's released a couple of volumes of this. Um, it's just, if anyone that's interested in graphic novels and, and adult comics, and along with the mystery of kind of Atlantis and lost ancient high technologies, it's a lot of those concepts you know, consciousness concepts, all that type of thing, red hair giants, all that type of thing. It's all bundled up into this really intriguing story. I've read it. I've, I've talked with Josh. Hopefully, I'll do a podcast with him at some point in the future too. Uh, I kind of helped him consult a little bit on some of the concepts and, and those types of things in it. I find it really engaging. It's it's super interesting. It's a, a really good story. It is, an, it is aimed at adults. You can find all of this if you're interested in it at archeopunk.com. That's the website to go check this comic out. I'd highly recommend it. And then as usual, I just also wanted to take the time to say thank you to everybody who does support the channel through the value for value model. Uh, again, your support's the only reason I'm able to spend the time to make and edit all of these videos. The channel did pass a bit of a milestone recently, or even got a little shiny new little thing over here that, that, that commemorates it. Ooh, shiny. <laughs> So just a massive thank you to anybody who does subscribe to the channel as well as any of any of you who do support me through more direct means. There's lots of ways to do that if you're interested. They're all outlined at unchartedx.com slash support. I know it's been a little while since I've released some content. I've had a few things going on in my life now, but the, uh, the train is now back firmly on the tracks and I have plans for quite a bit coming out soon as well as there's going to be a lot of content coming out once I get through this Egypt trip. So until then, I'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers.